this is a sort of talk that we did when we started rolling out the great collaboration but i think we've we've amended it and there is new research sort of coming out all the time and it's really the the contribution that land use can make to the climate and ecological crisis that we know we're facing and i, I probably don't need to rehearse this with any of you but um it is both a, a climate and an ecological crisis so uh, it's no good just looking at carbon and carbon reduction we have to marry that with understanding what we're doing to biodiversity and find ways of both tackling carbon and ecology and, and these are just some of the indicators there's, there's been increasing research coming out now which um, is talking about things like climate velocity and what that basically means is that as the as the earth warms up the the boundaries of ecological systems are moving and they in the northern hemisphere they're moving northwards and they're moving further up the hills so if if you're a species that is at the very limit of your sort of ecological area if you cannot move with the boundary then you're liable to become extinct and um the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has produced a range of, of uh, measures for different species. But as a sort of rule of thumb, on average, um, ecological limits are moving northwards by about five kilometres every year. And they're moving uphill by slightly less. So if you're a species that cannot move, um, by five kilometers every year and you're at the limit of your ecological tolerance then you're liable to sort of go extinct and, and that is beginning to have significant impact on the way we think about responding to some of these things because our, our tradition up to now has been to have um, protected areas of high biodiversity surrounded by much larger areas of relatively low biodiversity such as intensive agriculture but also urbanization roads and so on and that doesn't create any networks for species to move those that can so the thinking is we've got to be far more holistic in the way we approach this problem and it's no good just saying we're going to have an area of high biodiversity and then the rest of it is going to be used for food production <laughs> We have got to have those reservoirs of high biodiversity, but we've also got to have a matrix, a network of, of corridors that creatures, uh, animals, plants, if possible, can move along. And that's where the idea of a nature recovery network comes in, that we're looking at a much more holistic approach. It also means that pragmatically, it's no good just working with farmers. We also need to look at uh, roadside verges. We also need to look at green spaces. And the Royal Horticultural Society has recently brought out a publication, for example, on the way that gardens can be adapted to begin to be part of this matrix. So it presents us with uh, a unique opportunity, really, to do a bit more joined up thinking in the way we, we think about the natural world. All, all that this slide does is give you some of the indicators that are happening within the UK. So a third of our bird species um, show evidence of response to climate change. So that's either the, the time at which they're nesting or where they're nesting and their migratory patterns. And of course, the other thing to point out is that a lot of these things are finely tuned. So there's no point in a, a migratory bird coming two weeks early if its major food source is not ready for it, which is how it obviously adapted historically. We're, we're seeing a lot of impact on tree mortality and um, the Forestry Commission are already flagging up that some of the species that grow particularly well locally may not survive beyond the mid-century, um, sessile oak being one of those. So that needs to impact on what trees we think we might plant to future-proof some of this. I, I've mentioned the timing of biological events. That is now well, well attested that things uh, generally, um, spring is occurring earlier, autumn, uh, winter is occurring later. And there's been quite a lot of tweets recently about plants that are actually in bud in the garden that wouldn't normally have been seen at this time of year and so on. And we are seeing an incidence, greater incidence of exotic pests and diseases. Um, it's particularly true in the agricultural mm. world, and, world and some of these are quite dangerous. Um, equine flu, for example, and things which we hadn't really seen before, but which are, if they came, would have a huge economic impact on what we're about. Agriculture um, 
is, uh, I, uh, there are two slides really, but agriculture as part of the problem. So agriculture's contribution to climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, internationally, it's up to about 25%, but in the UK, it contributes between nine and 10% of our carbon dioxide outputs in, in equivalent CO2 terms. What makes agriculture interesting and different from all, almost all other human sectors is the proportion of greenhouse gases. Very little is carbon dioxide and the vast majority is nitrous oxides and methane. Individually, they're much more potent greenhouse gases than CO2, but they also behave differently in the atmosphere from CO2. So whereas if you're looking at things like the thermal efficiency of a house, it's relatively easy to measure and relatively easy to take action to, as it were, reduce carbon dioxide output. The bits that are easy to do in agriculture are things like the fuel use, when you come to actual land management and particularly grazing from ruminants, it's much more imprecise because there are too many variables to measure to actually say, well, if you, if you halved your grazing regime, the intensity of grazing, would you necessarily have the greenhouse gas outputs? And, and where we're sort of getting to there then is probably not to worry about being able to measure these things to 10 decimal points, but at least to know the general trajectory of travel and, and to begin to stimulate debate on that. Uh, and that's certainly what's happening at the moment. And for our part of the world, ruminants and ruminant grazing is going to be quite an important part of that debate. But again, there are huge nuances because it isn't just a case of, well, let's remove all animals from the landscape because there are multiple benefits to grazing and areas of high biodiversity, some of those need to be grazed. Permanent pasture is a very good sink for carbon dioxide, but it has to be managed. And the best way of managing it is with ruminants. So it's a much more nuanced argument than simply saying, well, let's all go vegan that isn't going to work. And one of the worst things we could do is to plough up permanent pasture in order to grow arable crops. So locally, we've got to understand those nuances and we've got to work within a much more holistic framework and not just go down the carbon route. As I've mentioned, it's a carbon and ecology crisis that we're facing. Um, agriculture is uh, part of the problem is then the flip side is that agriculture is definitely part of the solution. And again, the IPCC um, has indicated ways in which land use can materially uh, impact, positively impact on greenhouse gas um, production. And agriculture is vitally important if the rest of us are going to be net zero because we already know that with the best will in the world, there are some industrial practices where we still will produce carbon dioxide. And that has to be offset. And the potential for utilizing the soil is the best way of offsetting that. So lots of people will talk about agriculture as part of the problem, and that is undeniably true, particularly ruminants. But agriculture is most emphatically part of the solution. And I guess that's where we want to go and encourage farmers and others to see themselves as part of that. Th these are headline indicators about the savings that you can get by doing some of these actions. And we'll talk a bit more about what these mean in, in a second. So low carbon farming practices. But notice as well, this isn't just about going back to organic methods of production. Within this, there is some very high tech solutions and some quite controversial solutions. And the one that I point out is second from the bottom, which is the emphasis on bioenergy crops. Um, if you look at the National Farmers Union publication about achieving net zero by 2040, the estimate is that about half of the savings in greenhouse gases are going to be through bioenergy carbon capture, utilization and storage, or BECUS as it's called. But Sometimes that can be high industrial processes in the middle of the countryside. And there's a big debate about whether that's what you want locally. And also there's very little debate within the bioenergy crops about their impact on the ecology. So if the only lens you're looking at it is carbon, there's a plus, 
But if you're looking at carbon plus other considerations such as biodiversity, then it's not all plain sailing at all. So there's a lot of debate going on out there about potential. Some of these things are easily realized. Some require massive investment. But there are certainly things that we can do. And the bottom of that chart is the action that all of us can play as consumers in setting the market for agricultural products. And you'll all know there's a massive debate going on as well about the food that we eat and the way that that sets a parameter for um, carbon production. And it's, it is an absolute truism that we should all be eating less meat, both for our health and for the planet. But as I say, it's, not, it's, it's too simplistic to say that perhaps we shouldn't be eating any meat at all because there are other benefits to grazing animals. And there are certainly parts of diets where you do want to have some, um, some protein from meat. So th those debates will run, but in terms of the approach that the Green Network is trying to take, it is to understand the nuances and certainly not to prescribe that one size fits all because it doesn't. And at the bottom as well, we have to recognize that people earn their living from producing the food that we eat. And we certainly don't want to disenfranchise that from being able to do that. Um, I came in on the end of a conversation about the importance of soil. Soil is absolutely critical. If there's just one message that we can get across to people, it is about the importance of soil. And that's because soil is potentially a massive carbon sink. There is more carbon in the soil than there is in the atmosphere, and it's only secondary to the ocean. And of course, whereas there's not much we can do to manipulate the ocean, there's a great deal that we can do to manipulate the soil. We've added to the problem by the way we farmed historically and released vast amounts of carbon, but it's pot potentially possible to reverse that and to start managing uh, soil, not only for food production, but in ways that actually increase the carbon sink. And as I said earlier, we must do that if we're going to achieve net zero for the whole of our industrial processes. Soil is potentially the, the savior of us all, as it were. So how we protect and manage the soil is important. The bar chart along the top is, just gives you an indication of that. So the, the one, the, the graph to the right of the um, vertical line uh, are the, is the production of carbon dioxide. And the little green bit to the left is the potential for land use to act as a carbon sink. Soil will not save us on its own. We have absolutely got to reduce the carbon outputs from all other sectors of industry. But when we've done that, soil can do its bit to make us net zero. And that was recognized in the Paris Agreement because it launched the four parts per thousand initiative. So that was to try and increase carbon stock within the soil internationally by four parts per thousand or 0.4 percent per year. That's easier said than done, but if you did that, that would be the equivalent of locking up Europe's complete carbon output every year. That's the significance of it. Now, it's not easy to improve soil organic matter, but it can be done. It takes a long time, so it's easier to talk about it, and we must start moving in that direction, but don't underestimate how long it's going to take to achieve some of these targets and of course as with the Paris Agreement although lots of people signed up we're still waiting to see some of uh, some of the countries at least take real action but the UK was one of those signatories to the four parts per thousand initiative um, so this just emphasizes the point of that increasing soil organic matter is a definite thing we should be doing and that's got to do, I mean, there are loads of variables involved. So again, one, a blueprint, one size does not fit all, but it's to do with the balance between um, photosynthesis, decomposition, but for some of that photosynthesis, as I've said already, you might need ruminants to graze it and so on. So it's not just, it's not straightforward about just growing a crop and then what happens to the crop. Um, if there's one message you take away tonight, it is about looking at soils and encouraging people to be more responsive to their soils. And that's already happening in Herefordshire. I mean, that's the good news. So whereas um, I've been involved with a thing called Farm Herefordshire for the last four years, four years ago, it was really hard work to get farmers to come and talk about soils. Now there's 
particularly during COVID, there's been no end of webinars taking place, which have been well attended. And there is growing interest in the quality and value of our soils. There's also growing concern. Um, there is some serious scientific research that shows that soil fertility, even in the UK, has significantly declined over previous years. Um, and that just throwing more inorganic compounds at it will not reverse that. We've got to actually build up soil structure and understand the biology of the soil as well as the chemistry of the soil. So what are we actually talking about? And if we're talking to farmers uh, and other land managers, what practical things are we looking at? Um, and the big one is what you actually do to the soil in the first place and about trying to disturb it as little as possible. Now we've, most of us have grown up with a system in which, you know, plowing is part of the normal cycle of events. But plowing, um, although it breaks up the soil, releases vast amounts of carbon if you get it wrong, certainly. So there's a lot of interest in ways of growing crops which um, either don't plow at all, which you call zero tillage, or minimum tillage, min-till in the jargon, min-till and zero-till. Um, that has other benefits as well because often when you plow that's when sediment gets washed off into your rivers and you get a lot of erosion so the more you can grow crops without actually breaking up the soil significantly the better uh, utilizing available soil water so not allowing your soils to get waterlogged basically and allowing the plant to utilize the water that's there uh, and again that has beneficial effects on soil microbial activity. Waterlogged soils are not particularly healthy soils at all uh, and can cause quite a lot of problems. And then the other big thing is not having bare soil uh, and there's a lot of interest again within Herefordshire on things called cover crops and the name gives it away. So when you harvest you immediately plant another crop and it's not necessarily that you're going to harvest that second crop, it is about making sure that the soil is covered uh, and so during periods of high intensity rainfall, there's a protective layer over the soil. If you grow the right crop, it can be a green manure. And indeed, you could, if necessary, plow that in when you then plant your commercial crop. The, the difficulty is that a lot of farmers at the moment still see that as a cost rather than a benefit. But the science is growing that actually in the long term, this, is, uh, this will improve soil quality protect the greatest asset that you've already got, which is the soil that's already on your farm. So there are certainly farmers who are growing cover crops. And again, a lot of debate about what is the best cover crop to grow under these conditions and on these soils. So there's no blanket approach. You've actually got to work out what's best for your farm. Um, but there's lots of people out there with information and advice on those techniques. There is huge interest in planting trees. And I do not want to dampen that interest at all, but I do want to flag up um, because a lot of people are interested in planting trees because of the ability of trees to capture carbon and lock it up. They can certainly do that, but most people are surprised at the extent to which they actually do it. It's much lower than is popularly thought. So if you look at um, standing timber, the standing timber is only about 18% of the carbon within a forested area. Most of it is in the soil. So by all means plant the tree, but if your method of extraction of the tree is simply to pull it out and cause huge soil erosion, you actually might have made the situation worse in growing that crop. Um, the, if, I mean, this is, this is a back of the envelope job, but I'm going to stand by it, that if you, if you doubled woodland UK cover, technically that's achievable, though it's, it's far higher than any government target that's been set. But if you doubled woodland stock within the UK and you allowed those trees to grow to maturity, at the end of that, you'd have locked up about one year's worth of carbon output. But of course, it's going to take 40 plus years for the, trees, the trees to grow to maturity. So trees are actually important for a whole range of things. Uh, and carbon is probably not the most significant. The, the other thing that we've got to get right is the right tree in the right place. And there are some horror stories in Herefordshire, unfortunately, where people looked at areas of what they considered to be unproductive grasslands and thought, we'll plant them with trees. They were, in fact, very biodiverse rich grassland meadows 
and no, they're not particularly good for growing crops, but they were hugely important in terms of the genetic stock for biodiversity. And you really shouldn't have planted trees there. So it, again, it's trying to understand the nuances. The Hereford Wildlife Trust have produced a really good publication, right tree in the right place. And again, you've got to carbon proof it. You've got to know what you're going to do with a tree at the end of its life. Because if all you're going to do is burn it, then you dissipate all that carbon um, straight away. And that's obviously what's happened in California, for example. Uh, those forest fires in California have released huge amounts of additional CO2 virtually overnight into the atmosphere. So by all means, plant trees. But again, do understand the nuances and take advice on the right tree and begin to carbon proof it in terms of what, what sort of climate are we likely to have by 2050? And is the tree that you're planting at the moment the right one for that, um, those expectations? So just to give you a, 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 some idea of the scale, in, in Herefordshire, uh, it's 2016 data, it will have changed a little bit, but not a lot. So 2,800 farms, 77% um, of the land area, 12% is woodland, which is quite low. We could easily double that. And the Marches Nature Partnership has set a target of doubling woodland cover by 2030. And we're looking at 2,300 farmers, but 10,000 people who earn a living from actually farming. So that's not the food chain. Um, and as you all know, I mean, we are big in ruminants. So if we're going to tackle and reach net zero, we've got to take ruminants uh, ruminant seriously and understand what, what is the trade-off between grazing on the one hand and the greenhouse gases that the ruminants um, put out on the other. Uh, you know, they're an alimentary canal with gas produced at both ends and they're very efficient at doing that. Um, they produce nice food, but there are, there are downsides. Uh, poultry, we are, I think the poultry, well, we were certainly the poultry capital of the UK, uh, less so now. Um, uh, poultry producers are moving outside of the county, but we have a significant number of birds. That has an impact, um, some of it beneficial. We have very phosphate rich soils. Uh, unfortunately, though, we're still spreading phosphate um, when we probably don't need to. So we need to get those balances right as well. And the other thing we've got to take into account when we're dealing with farmers and land managers is that an awful lot of what drives them uh, comes from outside and in particular comes from government policy. And that will be equally as true after Brexit has fully taken place as it was under the common agricultural policy. Uh, there are three strands to government policy which will impact on land management and by this time next year we should have a pretty good idea about what they're all about because the Agriculture Bill and the Environment Bill are currently going through Parliament. Um, the Agriculture Bill has in, in, um, introduced the language of ELMS, Environmental Land Management Scheme. So this is what farmers will be paid for as public goods, i.e. things that aren't about food production, but are about things that the rest of us benefit from. And that could include carbon capture. Uh, should include carbon capture. It will include things like clean air, clean water, biodiversity and so on. So th there's a lot of activity going on there. The ELM scheme will actually be launched in 2024 but there are pilot projects taking place uh, and it's about how you price some of these things and provide incentives for farmers to manage their land in ways that gives us some of these public benefits. So the Agriculture Bill is due to go through all of its stages in Parliament by next year. The Environment Bill is also going through Parliament at the moment, uh, and that has introduced the idea of nature recovery networks. And as I say, that's it's a much more holistic approach. And the danger is that we just see that as impacting on farmers. There is a huge role to play in urban areas as well, and in, in green land and green infrastructure to create a viable nature recovery network and not just leave it to those who actually farm the 77%. Um, but it's building on the back of a 25 year environment plan that was published two years ago anyway. So the devil's in the detail, it's making all the right noises. It's beginning to tie up the idea that there is both a climate and an ecological emergency. But the third strand, which will probably impact on all of us um, is the national food strategy. And that's going to be saying quite a lot about the diets that we eat and market expectations. 
Part one was published in July. Part two is going to include a discussion on diet and its contribution to climate change, to biodiversity and so on. So next year, you should expect a lot more of debate and discussion going on about the diets they, that we eat. And you're probably aware of the Eat Lancet report and so on. So reports which are looking at global diets, uh, recommendations as to how you adopt a diet, which is actually more in tune with what the planet's about. And, and then on the right hand side of this um, screen, there are things which are not from government, but which are going to be hugely influential. And I've just mentioned some of those already. So the Eat Lancet report, the planetary diet, uh, United Nations targets on biodiversity, living planet report. These, these are things that actually led to the extinction rebellion um, movement really, because they're the ones that flagged up that we are significantly losing species at an alarming rate, both in numbers uh, of species and also in total numbers of, of animals that remain or animals and plants that remain. Um, but then also other signs of hope too. So the National Farmers Union, I used to work for them. Um, they are quite a reactive organization in many ways, but they have nailed their colors to the mast of achieving you know, zero carbon by 2040. So uh, they've got an uphill task to, uh, as to how they actually deliver that in practice, but they've nailed their colours to the mast and we should applaud them for that and want to support them for that. Um, and they've got these three broad strands. It, it's quite interesting, and I may be speaking slightly out of court, but it, it, it's, the NFU is very reluctant to tell farmers to produce less uh, or to significantly change the way they do things. So their, their goal in a sense is yes, we'll, we'll still have ruminants, will just make them more efficient. That's a good thing to do, but probably we need less ruminants as well, and someone has got to be brave enough to say that. Uh, there is interest in looking at um, hedgerow management, more woodland on farms, but as I say, it's nuanced. We actually want corridors, not just small mosaics, and um, we want to not just plant woodland on what is already species rich grassland. And, and that's a problem that the way farms are structured often is there yours, there's your intensive livestock bit and then the margins around the edge and it's about tink tinkering at the margins. That may not be enough. We actually do need to find ways of farming which are actually more inducive and conducive with nature as well. Uh, and that's increasingly being called regenerative farming. So ways of producing a crop that we all need food and so on, but in ways that, that enhance biodiversity rather than in spite of biodiversity. And as I say, the big one in terms of the actual potential savings is renewable energy and this idea of a bioeconomy. The difficulty there is the scale. There's a lot of merit in having small woodland plots, in having combined heat and power plants, in having uh, appropriate sized anaerobic digesters. But if you really are going to achieve the significant savings that some of these reports talking about, you're actually looking at industrial scale processes. And it's a big debate as to whether that is actually what we need, either from an aesthetic point of view, um, or actually whether, because it, it doesn't really take account of the ecological emergency, it is just looking at the lens of carbon. And then there's a number of technical fixes being thought about and implemented. So biochar is essentially charcoal, but um, it's stable charcoal. It's carbon rich charcoal. Uh, it's made from an energy crop, so it's an industrial process. But the idea is that you integrate it into the soil to add organic matter and it improves other things as well. Water retention, microbial activity. It's not taken off in a big way yet, but it's being uh, potentially looked at and could be used on some farms. I've mentioned already no-till and zero-till. There's a lot of interest in this. There are farmers that are doing it, but as with all biological systems, there is a downside and the downside is how you manage weed control. Uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the benefits of plowing is that it helps to control some pretty nasty weeds min-till and no-till doesn't necessarily, so it's up to now relied quite heavily on some uh, herbicides. Um, and some of those herbicides are not particularly pleasant and some almost came close to being banned anyway. So I think this is one of the points to emphasize. There isn't a single fix and there isn't a one size fits all. 
And what we're trying to do is to get a nuanced balance about multiple objectives through the way in which we use lands. But there are certainly farmers who are looking at min-till and no-till. There is a web-based uh, support group for those. And there are a number of projects. It, it's been more apparent in North America and Canada on quite a major scale, but it's been utilised in Herefordshire to some extent as well. And then things that we've known about for donkey's years, but it's again reminding people. So if you are going to plough, it's where you plough and how you plough. Uh, and contour ploughing is ploughing along the contours. So in fact, you're stopping water in the um, in the plough divots rather than encouraging it to roll down the hill. And, you know, um, this is not new, but a lot of the techniques that are being talked about aren't new. They were in the Code of Good Agricultural Practice 30 odd years ago, but perhaps they're coming back into vogue and that has to be encouraged. I've mentioned cover crops. Uh, that's certainly being looked at, but the difficulty there is people often see it just as a cost and we want them to see it uh, uh, as an investment. Agroforestry, so it's not very big in this country, but it is in some countries. So this is much closer integration between trees and um, ar ar agricultural production. Um, whether you graze sheep, for example, within orchards, and it's possible with, some, with the right species of sheep, uh, which is generally the Shropshire. Uh, in fact, most of our Shropshire are exported to the continent where they're used in grazing systems rather than being used in this country. But again, it, it's got potential and it's being looked at. Um, there's a lot of interest locally in the way we manage our meadows because meadows are potentially carbon sinks and they're certainly important for biodiversity. So there is a meadows group in Herefordshire. That's Caroline Hanks, who uh, is the one kneeling in front, who heads it up. So again, there's information and advice there. The knack with all of this, though, is to get sufficient critical mass to make it beneficial. One field on a farm is potentially important, but given this, this idea of a nature recovery network, it's much better if we can encourage sort of landscape scale activity to take place and these corridors, these all important corridors. And then the other jargon word, which is um, used a lot, is rewilding. Um, I think it's probably an unfortunate name and it's got uh, some un an unfortunate press, really. But this is about growing things using much more natural processes and actually deliberately restoring the land by using natural processes. The picture is of the Never State, uh, which is the sort of... Um, the go-to place for rewilding. It's quite interesting though that this estate, which is about I think 1200 acres, earns far more from ecotourism than it does from food production. Um, so is that replicable in Herefordshire? Uh, it's also got bad press because largely the writings of George Monbiot, there, there is an element of rewilding which is perfectly valid, which is that if you're going to introduce, for example, um, animals that graze, and that's part of your management, then historically there would have been predators that grazed on those, that uh, predated on those graziers uh, and therefore stopped them from getting out of, uh, out of sync. And that's where the idea of reintroducing the lynx or the jackal or the brown bear comes from. Again, it's probably not likely to happen in Herefordshire and it probably doesn't need to. But the basic principles are again, really part of a um, nature recovery network. That you're looking holistically at land use and you're trying to produce food in ways that are more in tune with nature uh, and you're creating a mosaic of semi-natural habitats um, that animals can utilize, animals and plants can utilize. And then the other big thing which is already happening in Herefordshire is managing the land to mitigate um, extreme weather and in particular flooding. So probably for the last 40 years, most government investments into flood alleviation has been about uh, engineering design. And this is about going back to land use and better ways of managing the land. And essentially, again, it's the same message. Keep the soil in the field, keep the water in the soil as far as possible and stop it from cascading off by things like leaky dams and um, natural structures and utilizing dew ponds and all sorts of things that I guess our, our predecessors would actually have known quite well. Um, this is a leaky dam, uh, it, it, as the name is, it's blocking a water course, but it's not blocking it totally. 
And the idea is that you hold up the flow, but you don't stop it completely. Um, loads of these are now taking place across Herefordshire. And, you know, with the rain that we've got, it's, it, you can prove that it makes a difference. And there's going to be a lot more scope for this sort of natural uh, way of managing land uh, and mitigating flood. And these are the catchments within Herefordshire, which are part of a pilot project um, looking at natural flood management. So this is going on. Again, there's information and advice there. The project is co-hosted by Herefordshire Council and the Environment Agency. Um, and Farm Herefordshire, which at the moment I chair, is, has been doing a lot. And this is the driver for this is water quality. It's about phosphates in the Y and the lug. But the management practices um, are also conducive to the things we've been talking about in more general terms. So cover crops, uh, stopping soil erosion and so on. I think that's it in terms of the presentation but the idea was to sort of give you an overview. The critical messages are soil and joined up thinking and I, I think there's huge potential for farmers and parish councils and churchyards and green spaces to begin to work together to achieve some of this mosaic that we're going to need. Yeah, and those are, those are all local. Those are all happening already 